So glad that you're here with us today as we're continuing in our series Under the Sun, where we've been exploring the book of Ecclesiastes, a book attributed to the great King Solomon. And each week we've been looking at a different section of Ecclesiastes and, and thinking about how it might meet us where we are as we live under the sun. We've talked about under the sun isn't just a catchy phrase, but it's sort of a time-bound, earth-bound perspective as opposed to an eternal one. And we've looked under, we've looked below the surface of our culture and our lives to get to deeper truths, eternal truth. And so thus far we've talked about living larger than ourselves for a greater purpose beyond just our lives, not just pursuing pleasure, but pursuing God. Speaking of that beautiful song we've, we just sang, we've talked about singing for solace in every season, in any season of our lives. Uh, we've also talked about uh, how we can be in relationship with one another. We, we have talked about uh, cultivating companionship in our lives. And then last week, we talked about generosity. We talked about giving with an open hand. Today... We're focusing in on the theme of wisdom. Everybody say wisdom. In fact, Ecclesiastes is located in the wisdom section of the Bible where we find Job and Psalms and, and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. These are the wisdom books, also thought of as a kind of poetry. And it's to these books where Christians over the last couple thousands of years and even the people of God in centuries before that, this is the section of the scripture where people have gone to seek wisdom. In fact, that was the theme of last year's sermon series called what today's sermon is entitled, Word of the Wise. So if you want to do an even deeper dive on wisdom, you can go back to our YouTube channel and watch all of last year's, last summer's sermons. And you can be the wisest person possible. In fact, it was in Proverbs, which is what last year's sermon series was based on, where we find a tremendous number of Proverbs about wisdom in particular about conveying that wisdom, communicating wisdom, speaking wisdom. In fact, it's one of those Proverbs, when it was recorded in Proverbs 18.4, when we hear a person's words can be life-giving water. Words of true wisdom are as refreshing as a bubbling brook. Our words are a way that we can communicate wisdom. And words can really shape our lives. Words are how we interact with one another, how we communicate, sometimes non-verbally, but most of the time with our words, whether we're saying what we want to say, whether we're saying what others are looking for us to say, or we're really trying to speak from the heart, to communicate, to connect. Words matter. Words matter greatly. Words can change the direction of our lives. I'll never forget when two words in particular changed my life for the future, changed the direction of my life. It was uh, a number of years ago now, in fact, about uh, 12 years ago, and Sarah and I had met. Things were were heating up between us. Uh, Things were sort of looking like we could have a future together. And then it hit me that this is, the one, this is the person that I want to spend the rest of my life with. And so I was able to, at a, her cousin's wedding, actually, I was able to pull her parents aside, and I was going to use my words to ask them for their blessing 
for uh, at ta asking her to marry me. And uh, we got up to the hotel room, and I said, you know, Fred and Catherine, I, I just love Sarah. And Sarah's mom burst out, and she said, oh, my goodness. And she already knew what I was going to say, okay? <laughs> and I said, wait, no, this is important. I want to I actually, I w if it's okay with you, I want to actually ask you. <laughs> I, I want to use my words in this moment, and, and I did. And it was a couple months later in San Antonio, Texas, where I created this uh, engagement scavenger hunt for her. So she was uh, going around to different locations to meet with some of her girlfriends, and then they would give her a clue where she, and then she had to go to the next spot. She had to figure out how to get there. And uh, it was a scavenger hunt based on these instructions, based on these words, and had some connection to our relationship. And then she finally got to my, my sister's house and, and gave her the instruction to go to a park where, where we spent some time, a park that was meaningful for us. And she, she arrived there, and I had our dog, her dog at the time there, and he and I were waiting. And in the time, she was spent a little longer with my sister than I expected, according to the itinerary. So I was starting to get, <laughs> was starting to get a little bit nervous. But eventually, I saw her coming through the clearing, and uh, the dog ran after her, and we kind of came over. And at this point, you know, I, I think she knows what's coming. Right? And so I did, you know, got down on one knee and I said, Sarah, you know, will you, I love you, will you marry me? And sort of mo like mother, like daughter, she didn't initially respond and she kind of covered her mouth, you know, like this, which is to be expected. And, you know, I was, I was waiting for her words. <laughs> I was awaiting her response. And, you know, she's, you know, she was giving me a positive indication, so I wasn't too concerned at that point. But I just wanted to verify. I just really needed to, again, words matter. And I just really needed to hear. And I just, I said, so, you know, will you? <laughs> and I said, does this sound OK? And she kind of, and I said, yes. <laughs> and she said, you know, I, I will. And at that point, with those words, my life changed forever. Our life together began in a new, began in a new and a different way. Those two words changed the direction of my life. Words matter. Words can be life-giving, as Proverbs just told us. They can be like a, a babbling brook. They can bring life and bring new things into our lives and our families and our relationships that can build us up. Words that are spoken with wisdom can make all the difference. And by the way, asking Sarah to marry me, that was the wisest thing I could have ever done, <laughs> just, just so we're all on the same page. We're going to look now at Ecclesiastes to see what Solomon has to say about words and about wisdom. We're going to read together in chapter 9, and you can follow in your Bible and one we've provided for you or the scripture on the screen. Solomon writes this, I also observe the following example of wisdom under the sun. It impressed me greatly. There was a small town with only a few residents. A mighty king came against it, surrounded it, and waged a terrible war against it. Now there lived a man, now there lived in that town a poor but wise man who saved everyone by his wisdom. But no one remembered that poor man. So I thought, wisdom is better than might. But the wisdom of commoners is despised, and their words aren't heeded. The calm words of the wise are better heeded than the racket caused by a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one incompetent person destroys much good. The scriptures tell us that Solomon was the wisest person to have ever lived. In fact, the scripture tells the story of the fact that a Solomon could, could pray to God and to ask, could ask God for anything, and instead of wealth and riches and influence, what did he ask for? He asked for wisdom. So God granted him wisdom, but because 
of his humble approach, because of his reverence for God, he was also blessed with great wealth, riches, and influence, a king of a mighty kingdom. Now, to impress Solomon wouldn't have been an easy task. But we, what we read about the story that Solomon recounts for us is that he was greatly impressed. He was impressed by the story of this man who saved the city, who saved the town by his wisdom. Now sadly, under the sun, as Solomon tells us, this man would be forgotten. He wouldn't be remembered for what he did, but that didn't stop the truth of what he shared, of the wisdom that he spoke. That wisdom itself is greater than might, greater than any power on earth. Wisdom is enduring, is eternal. You see, as people, you and I, we, we tend to have a, a short-term memory, <laughs> whereas God, the eternal, has a long-term memory. In fact, we get, we get a, a, an image of this in the book of the prophet Malachi. In Malachi 3.16, we get this image of a scroll of remembrance, a scroll on which words or names are placed in God's eternal memory. Malachi writes this, he says, those revering the Lord, each and every one, spoke among themselves. The Lord paid attention and listened to them. Then a scroll of remembrance was written before the Lord about those revering the Lord, the ones meditating on his name. When we speak with words of wisdom, those kind of things are remembered by God. Our God who has a long-term, eternal memory. Our truth today that we're focusing on, our expression of what Solomon is recording for us, is to speak with wisdom to really and truly be able to communicate the truth of the wisdom about which Solomon wrote. Now, we don't always do that, do we? But this is our calling, this is our invitation to speak with wisdom. This is how the man in Solomon's story, this is how he got his wisdom across. What did he do? Did he just sit in his home? and wait for someone to ask his opinion? No. He spoke his wisdom. He spoke with wisdom. And that is what saved the city. <laughs> that truth is what God will remember, that kind of eternal truth. I want to break down speaking with wisdom into... Two areas. I actually want to. I want to think about ways that we can be mindful of it, and so I want to give us a couple keys. I have a, a small key. You probably can't even see it right now. It's like a locker size key, but I, I want to give us a key to start to think about how we speak with wisdom, and we can keep this key on our keychain to be able to carry around with us in our life and in our days. The first key is actually what happens before we speak. And that is to listen before we speak. How often are we quickly to share our perspective, to share our opinion before pausing to really hear what someone is saying? Try to do this this week. I'll try with you because it's truly difficult to be able to fully hear what someone is saying before, you've, uh, before you form your next thought. So often we're thinking about what we're going to say, and that keeps us from really hearing what someone else is saying. Can we pause and really 
listen. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a 20th century pastor, German pastor, professor at a seminary, and martyr in the Holocaust. He spoke out about Nazi Germany, and his, he gave his life for the cause of Christ, of speaking with wisdom. He was a wise man and wrote a lot about what it costs to follow Jesus and, and how we can best live in community together. And his wisdom led him to a particular observation about the importance of listening, of really hearing one another. And in fact, in one of his best known works, which is called Life Together, which is a truly a, an essential in the library of a follower of Jesus, Life Together by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he makes this observation. The first service one owes to others in community involves listening to them. Just as our love for God begins with listening to God's word, the beginning of love for others is learning to listen to them. God's love for us is shown by the fact that God not only gives God's word, but also lends us God's ear. Bonhoeffer goes on to say this, we do God's work for our brothers and sisters when we learn to listen to them. This is where it gets personal for me today. Because he writes, so often Christians, especially preachers, think that their only service is always to have to offer something when they're together with other people. They forget that listening can be a greater service. Christians who can no longer listen to one another will soon be no longer listening to God either. That is why it matters to listen. In fact, I was meeting with a member of our church, a member of our church community recently this week, and uh, I, I didn't know exactly the, the content of our meeting and what that would be. And so going into a meeting like that, I, I typically want to have some things to share and to offer, but all that was actually required of me is I sat down across the table was truly to listen. That was what the pastor needed to do in that moment, and I think the same can be true for you, with your spouse, with a friend. Sometimes you don't always need to be able to speak or articulate a solution, but sometimes you just need to be ready to listen. Can you listen with open ears and an open heart? Because that is really an expression of wisdom. Listening before you speak is the first key on our keychain of wisdom. The next comes right from the scriptures. The next key is to speak the truth in love. To speak the truth in love, and we'll just add that right to our keychain. Ephesians 4.15 is where we get this concept of speaking the truth in love where we read instead, by speaking the truth in love, let's grow in every way into Christ. Remember, as a young man, being a part of a class where I would receive wisdom in an unexpected way. One of my spiritual men mentors, Father Jim Hess, led this class called peer ministry for 12th grade high school students, students where we were learning to minister to one another in community. And in order to facilitate this, to be in community together, we agreed on some things. In fact, we agreed on four things that were inspired by a book of wisdom called The Four Agreements. And the very first agreement was this. Be impeccable with your word. 
The little description of it describes being impeccable with your word this way. Speak with integrity. Say only what you mean. Avoid using the word to speak against yourself or to gossip about others. Use the power of your word in the direction of truth and love. Speaking the truth in love doesn't mean that what we say will always be easy, even though we're doing it from a loving place. Speaking the truth in love doesn't mean that we'll always be able to get it right, but if we can continually be seeking to speak with wisdom in a way that expresses truth in love, then we will be well on our way to speaking in a way that God would receive, would remember. Listening before we speak, speaking the truth in love, those are our two keys. But you know what? Sometimes it's good to have a spare key. (laughs) Do you have a spare key at home? You don't need to tell me where it is. I'm not coming by. But sometimes it's good to keep that key under the rock or under the mat or in a place that when we've lost our keys, we know where to find it. Now, there's a key that was, in, that was alluded to in the key about speaking the truth in love, and it was to avoid gossip. And this is the hidden key. This is the key on which community is truly built, to speak directly, to communicate the truth. In fact, well, this key looks a little bit different. It sort of looks like a, a backup key. This will be the key of avoiding gossip that will add to our keychain. Let me try to express to you the significance of this. A rabbi friend uh, once told me this story, the true story of two young women who boarded a city bus. They got on the bus and one asked the other, did you hear Sarah just got engaged yesterday. Not my Sarah, by the way. Sarah just got engaged yesterday. And then the girl back to her said, oh my goodness, I didn't hear that. She goes on to say, well, you know, I'm a little bit concerned because Sarah has difficulty managing her own life. Not to mention a relationship and maybe a family one day. How is she actually going to do that? The other young woman says, yes, and guess what? She's a terrible cook. She had me over for dinner, and I could barely swallow the food that she gave me. How is she going to prepare meals for a family? That's just not possible. The other friend went further. Yes, and she's always late. How is she going to manage her schedule with her husband and her family if she's always showing up late? It's just not going to work. Just then, an older woman who was sitting in front of them turned around and she said, Excuse me, girls, I want to thank you for what you've said today. My son is about to be married to Sarah, (laughs) and you have given me very important information that I didn't know. In fact, what I'm going to do is go to my son directly now and urge him to break off the engagement. These are things that that don't make for a healthy marriage or relationship, and I can't thank you enough for telling me because I need to warn my son about what you've spoken today that he truly needs to break off the relationship, the engagement. And at that moment, the girls were mortified. They said, no, 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 we were just talking. (laughs) Sarah should be married to your son. Please don't break off the engagement. That would be the worst thing. To which the older woman replied, I appreciate your sensitivity, but this is just what must happen. Without what you shared with me today, my son would have been set up for a life 
of disappointment. And then she turned back around as the bus continued to the next stop. After pausing for a minute or so, the woman didn't hear any more conversation behind her, so she turned back around and she said, girls, my son is not going to marry Sarah, but imagine if he was. Imagine if my son was going to marry Sarah. Imagine what your words could have done. It's a true story about the impact of our words and how using them to gossip, using them to speak about someone else when they're not present can destroy relationships, can destroy community. And that's why it's our backup key. This is uh, an issue that plagued even early followers of Jesus, which is why Jesus urged direct communication. In fact, uh, on one occasion, Jesus said this in the Gospel of Matthew. He said, if your brother or sister sins against you, go and correct them when you're alone together. He said, if they listen to you, then you've won over your brother or sister. But if they won't listen, take with you one or two others so that every word may be established by the mouth of two or three witnesses. But if they still won't pay attention, report it to the church. Jesus urged us to avoid gossip, to speak directly, because that's what builds up community. That's what makes us stronger in Christ. And if you have a concern or a legitimate issue, we have to go to that person directly and speak with them. That's the only thing that's, that's the only way that something can be remedied. Our keychain of wisdom, of speaking wisdom, has on it, listen before we speak. Speaking the truth in love and avoiding gossip when we speak. I want to ask you as we conclude this morning, this question. Do you believe that God created the world? Do you believe in a God of creation? And it's okay if you don't. It's okay if that's a stretch for you. But if you do, if you believe that our God is a creator who put into motion everything we see and experience under the sun and beyond this life, then you believe in the power of words. You believe in the power of speaking with wisdom. That's because it all started when God spoke creation into existence. Think of the most dramatic sights you've ever seen. Think of looking out upon a canyon that was carved centuries, thousands, millions of years ago. Think about that sunset as the orange meets the blue in the clouds and creates a lasting memory, an Instagram moment. Think about gazing into a black sky full of stars and being unable to count them. If we believe in a God of creation, then we believe that God, with words, made all that possible made all that happen, that God spoke creation into existence. So what are you speaking? What are you creating with your words? May you be empowered to speak with wisdom. And here's why. Your relationships will be stronger, and your work more impactful and your life more full. That is why this matters. Why when we speak with wisdom, we can speak the way that God invites us to. Amen.